Oh, welcome to Still Speak Podcast. So tonight's video we're going to get to in a moment, but first I wanted to say a very huge thank you to the YouTube channel Chasing. She used to go by Chasing Truth. And the reason for that is that last night she had a post asking people if they have a channel and to put it below and describe what their channel is about. And this was really, really kind of her to do. Most creators on YouTube won't even allow you to mention your YouTube channel, let alone advertise it. So a big, huge thank you to her for being amazing and allowing that and being the better person um, on YouTube because most don't allow that at all. And uh, it's more about tearing one another down in jealousy rather than to build up um, each other. So due to that, I gained 26 new subs, which is amazing. And that caused me to not only hit my 500 sub goal, but I went over it, which means now that within about a week, I'm going to have a community tab, which I've mentioned on here I really, really wanted because I can tell you when a video is going to be uploaded, I can make updates, put missing flyers, etc. So her post, which sparked me to get the 26 new subs, helped me in a way I can't even explain my gratitude. So my second thank you is to the 26 people who did click subscribe. I don't think you realize how much it means to me. I've been here busting my butt and really trying to push for that 500 minimum. And I was gaining a good amount of subs and then the holidays hit, you know, and people are busy and I get it, right? And then it just kind of like slowed down and I was sitting at like 488 for quite a while and uh, I was just getting kind of like, all right, I really want my community tab. <laughs> so thank you. I'm glad you're here. I hope you will like what you find on this channel and that it's not a disappointment. And if you do like it, please consider sharing with other people. The next thing that I wanted to talk about is I said on my last video, I believe it was, that I needed to hit a thousand subs to go live because that's what so many people told me. And then I don't know, curiosity got to me, so I was Googling it, and apparently that's actually not true. So I had to click this button, which takes you to this other page, and basically I had to verify my account, and then within 24 hours of verifying it, you can go live. Well, I did that already, which means I can go live. The issue is, is as I've mentioned, I'm a mom of three, so you can only imagine my house is loud 24 hours out of the day. Why? Because I also homeschool, so my kids are always here, and they're boys, so uh, they're loud. <laughs> and so um, I do these videos at night, and even still sometimes... You can hear them if you listen closely because they're in their room. They're supposed to be watching a movie and going to bed. But, you know, kids, you have to tell them 15 times to quiet down before they finally do. Uh, but I am going to try to do uh, one live a week or one live every two weeks. But they will be at night, which I know sucks for some people who are in, in different time zones. Um, but unfortunately, if I went live in the middle of the day, I'd have to mute the entire time or like tell you to hold on like every two seconds. So, or I would have to do it like really, really early in the morning. And even that, I don't even think I could pull it off because I have one kid that always seems to like wake up really early. And my point was just proven in real time. If you heard that, that was my youngest knocking on the 
uh, interior garage door asking for me. <laughs> um, my husband's in there, but you know, they always go to mom. Dad could be standing right there, but we got to ask mom. So anyway, we're going to do that. We're going to go live. We're going to get to know one another. You can ask me questions about cases. I can ask you questions about cases. It's going to be a lot of fun, but I just have to figure out how I'm going to do that. So that's the two updates I wanted to talk about. So I thank Chasing. If you don't know her, go sub to her. She's amazing. Um, thank you to the people who sub to me. I greatly appreciate it. I'm getting my community tab and I'm going to be going live. Now let's move on. Recently, I have been bringing up Summer Wells a little bit more frequently than I had been before due to the sheer amount of insanity that's involved in her case. And once I did the videos about Summer Wells, I said at that time all I really needed to say about it, I felt. And in my mind, I was like, all right, we'll wait for more developments or information. There'll be more to discuss and we'll revisit it when that happens. But since I did those videos, which were uh, late August into the beginning of September, really there's been a lot of, you know, excuse my French, bullshit, but there hasn't been any information or developments or even progress. It doesn't even seem like law enforcement has any idea what happened to Summer Wells. They haven't ruled out anybody and they haven't ruled out her, any of the ways that she could have disappeared. Whether it was her walking away, her being abducted, some type of foul play with someone or foul play with the parents, nothing's been ruled out. So there was no real reason to discuss it, but then I started to tune in to some of this drama that is her case on YouTube. And I was just finding myself, and I'm doing it right now, I'm like wiping my eyes, you know, and you're just like, oh my god, these people give me a headache. Um, it, it's, it's a mess. <laughs> the case is no longer about Summer Wells. It is all about her parents. It's just the way it is. They go around saying they care about Summer. That's not true. And it's very obvious because her name comes up very, very little in comparison to discussing all of the drama involving her story, including her parents. I've seen the worst of the worst when it comes to true crime cases and the way people talk to one another, handle one another, react to one another. Uh, it, it's rough out there. And if you don't follow any of it and you're like, Ugh, I don't even freaking know. I just tune it out. Well, pff, be thankful. And the reason I keep tuning into it is because I'm hoping to stumble across a discussion like I did the other day or possibly, you know, new information that I didn't hear about. And then I'm always disappointed because I'm like, Ugh, really? And it's just such a headache. I listened for like you know, 30 minutes and my head's pounding. And what's always fascinated me about her story is the amount of people who have um, attached to it, cling to it, um, or have gotten emotionally invested in it. And what about her story makes that happen? What is it? that gets people stuck to a story because you might get stuck to a story that I'm like, well, I followed that story, but I'm not as like invested in that story when, you know, vice versa. So there are some cases that I was really invested in. And one case was the Chris Watts case. I have since completely, and I mean completely, stopped listening, talking, discussing the Watts case for well over a year now because, woo, that case was also just, mm, 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 mm. and I just can't do it anymore. 
right? I just can't keep reiterating the same things, the same arguments, the same, all of it is just the same. But that was the case I was really invested in. Some people weren't, you know, some people felt like it's an open and shut case. What the hell is there to, to discuss? I mean, I would argue greatly with that because there's a lot to discuss in the lot's case, but that's their opinion and they just had no interest in it, you know, and so that does happen. But then there are particular cases where something in that story is what makes people cling to it, whether it's a personal reason or whatever. Let's talk Gabby Petito for a second. People clung to that story. Why? Well, in my opinion, both Gabby and Brian had a big social media footprint. We saw their video of their van life. She had all these Instagram posts. She seemed alive to us, even though we knew she most likely wasn't alive. In addition to that, you have this young couple who seemed to be in love, who goes out on this cross-country trip. They put a lot of time and effort and money and work into doing this. And one comes back with her van and the other's nowhere to be found, right? And then the icing on the cake was days later finding out that he left his house and never returned. So that in itself is a mystery, right? Because for a period of time, it was not only where is Gabby, but it was also where is Brian? It was both of them. It was a mystery. And so people got really interested in it. And the theories and speculation was off the chain. And that's just one example, okay? So... When I did my Summer Well series, I talked about other cases. I mentioned other cases briefly. And one was involving a girl who went missing a few years back in Florida. And the similarities of her disappearance to Summer and Summer's family. And I think this is just my personal opinion and you can think differently. I think with Summer's case, her parents is a huge reason why people got so attached to the story. Because their behavior, their words, the way they live, etc. was juicy. It was something to gossip about, to talk about, to judge them about. Okay? And I think that really, really sparked interest and a small amount of those people I wish it was more but a small amount of those people actually got attached to the case because they started to um, have sympathy for Summer's life prior to her going missing the way she lived the way she was treated the way she would you know be dressed and how her hair was done and um, possibly abused, etc. And some of them related because they were somewhere at some point in their lives or because they just got emotionally invested in this little girl. They felt that she was failed from the start only to end up going missing, etc. Right? And it doesn't help that her parents, specifically her father, Don Wells, was very chatty, has been from the beginning, and still is, and doesn't know when to shut the hell up, and talk to every YouTube channel there seems to exist about his daughter, and that just gave people more and more and more and more to discuss. And they felt like they needed to know every aspect of these people's lives and every person they ever had any type of involvement in. I know some channels that know every member, it seems, of the church they attend. Which, I mean, great, but is it relevant? Maybe. Maybe the close people in the church, but not like the whole congregation. But if you took everything that has happened in the summer story... From the moment she went missing to this very moment that this video is playing. 
and you actually, you know, was able to go through it all and erase all of the drama and the rumors and the speculations, if you erased all of that, you can actually see that her case has gone nowhere. Even with all this attention. Nowhere. We're the same spot we were six and a half months ago. I'm serious. There's been nothing. There's no no clear image of what happened to her. There's no evidence that's been uncovered. Nothing. There's no progress. And as I said, it doesn't even seem like law enforcement knows what the hell happened to this little girl okay but when you look at it as it is right now it looks like so much has happened and we're so much closer her being found and that's just not true it's the same things being talked about every single day and the only additions is don wells running his mouth (laughs) that's it that's all that has happened and bear with me tonight because i'm being a little bit long-winded into the story that I want to discuss, okay? And there's a reason for it. So when I did my series, and I talked about the different reasons why people were probably attached to the case, that's always stuck out in my mind. Why? Why is everybody so still attached that there's a live after live and video after video and the same things being said over and over and over and over and over and over over again? Why? Why? When there's so many kids who go missing. Oh my gosh. And so let me backtrack here because I think it was the beginning of September. I have started a series about three little boys. And the three little boys were all killed in the May-June time frame. Young boys. One was Amari Nicholson. Second one was Samuel Olson third one was um, uh, Cash Gurnan, excuse me, Cash Gurnan. And I never actually got around to my Cash Gurnan video, but I did do one on Samuel Olson, and I did one on Amari Nicholson. And Amari was killed by his mother's boyfriend, and Samuel Olson was killed by his father's girlfriend or fiance and then cash had been taken from his crib by somebody known to the neighborhood allegedly and he's in jail and it's not that cash's story wasn't important enough to tell it's just that what happened was after i started that series is when gabby petito's case took off and just before that is when the murdoch story that i had already started really took a massive turn and Alex Murda had uh, at the time we thought been shot in the head which we later found out was all staged and so I was going back and forth between Murda and then Gabby and Murda and Gabby and Murda and Gabby and then some missing person stories in the middle of all that and again there's not enough time in the day I love doing this I wish I could bring you 15 stories a day I physically can't do it I can't. I don't have time. Um, So I just never got around to doing Cash's story. But I feel that he's just as important. And I did start that series. So I'm going to finish it at some point. I promise. And I'm saying that because, you know, summer's been on my mind lately. And I've seen three stories that are getting a little bit of attention. One more so than the other two. But the same creators who have been talking about Summer Wells, what seems like every single day for the last six and a half months, they're not discussing these cases. And they're little girls who are relatively the same size, height, age as Summer, who just seem to vanish. Okay? Vanished. And props to the creators that do cover these stories. Big props to you. Because, you know, stories go into limbo when there's no information, there's no progress, there's no developments, no nothing. And Summer's one of those cases, like I said. 
And once I did my series, I was like, all right, we'll come back to it when there's new information, but there hasn't been. So there's nothing to really discuss unless we're just going to keep talking about the same thing over and over and over again. Um, that being said, though, a new sub commented and said that they actually would be interested in my condensed version of what I think happened this summer and her story. So I'm going to be working on that for that sub. And I'm, I'm glad that she asked for that because I think, again, so many people would like to follow her story. But they get so lost in all the drama. They don't even know, like, what's what, up, down, trying to decipher what's fact, what's rumor, what's the, you know, anyways. And there's a lot of other cases. Right now, we're in limbo about Murda. We're in limbo about Heidi Plank. We're in limbo about Dwayne Selby and his mother, Glenda Parton. We're in limbo on Melissa Trumpy. There's just been no information to discuss. We're still waiting on an update on Gabby Petito's story with Brian Laundrie and them closing that case, etc. And so, I mean, what are we going to do? Just sit around and wait and just keep talking about the same things over and over again until we have something new to talk about? No, right? No. We're going to continue forward, use that spare time to discuss other cases. And then when there's a development to discuss, we'll do that. And so you would think that in Summer's case, you can still keep her face and her name out there and spread awareness, but you can also be using all this extra time talking about the same stuff, you know, and do both at the same time and give awareness to these other children and what makes these young girls different from Summer's case. Is it because these young people don't have parents that are talking to the media? I mean, I don't know what it is. But these are the three girls we're going to be talking about, and I'm going to do a similar series like I started with Samuel Olson, Amari, and uh, Cash Gurnan. And the first one that we're going to talk about tonight, and I hope I don't say this little girl's name wrong because I would just hate to butcher um, her name, but it seems somewhat easy until the last name. Lena Sardar Kill, I think. So Lena, then Sardar, S-A-R-D-A-R, and the second name is K-H-I-L. And she is missing from San Antonio, Texas, which I'm somewhat familiar with. I actually went to San Antonio about two years ago. I have a very good friend who um, lives outside of the San Antonio area, and she was diagnosed with cancer, and I went to say... Um, my goodbyes. Um, she did ultimately pass away uh, a year later. It was my longest, um, <sighs> sorry, my longest running friend. And uh, she left behind uh, four kids. Anyways, um, so I'm familiar with that area. And uh, obviously, <laughs> discussing my friend is still a sore, sore spot for me. It, sorry, I'm being a little vulnerable there. Then we have Harmony Montgomery, and we have, the last one is Oakley Carlson. All young, beautiful little girls who just vanished. And two of these stories remind me of a story that I brought to you the same week I brought Gabby Petito's case. Actually, it was the same day that I brought you Gabby Petito's case on September 13th, and that was the story of missing Khaleesi Kusrel. And that little girl had not been seen in, I think it was seven or eight months by anybody. It turns out she is deceased. They have not recovered her body. Very, very sad story. If you want to look up my video about that, it was just broke my heart. That poor girl never stood a chance. Now, Lena's story was kind of um, triggering me a little bit when I was reading uh, a few groups' posts about her being missing due to um, what I like to call... <laughs> Uh, willingly ignorant comments. And by willingly, I say that because we have Google, okay? Now, 
if you don't like Google, you can do DuckDuckGo or whatever it's called. But there's really no reason for you to not understand a specific culture if you have Google at your fingertips. There's really no excuse for it because you could find the information, educate yourself, and so that you can make educated comments and not ignorant ones. So um, it's a little upsetting to see because her family are refugees from Afghanistan and not from what just happened, but two years ago. So you can only imagine there are going to be cultural differences and they are, you know, relatively new to America and how we live. And that needs to be taken into consideration. And what is done in Afghanistan is not going to be something that's done here and vice versa. And you can't expect for them to just come to this country, know everything about us, and just become us, okay, in a two-year period of time. In addition to that, there is, of course, a language barrier. So the father has been communicating with the media and the police and the mother um, through a translator, okay? And that can make an investigation very complex. And also, when you're talking about a language barrier, you know, there's sometimes how something is said in one place is not how it's said in another. And when you hear Don Wells in Summer Wells' case speak, he says things that a lot of Southern people say that up North people are like, what the hell is that supposed to mean? When really it means nothing, they're just saying something in a different way. So Lena is allegedly 55 pounds, has brown eyes and straight brown hair with a light skin complexion. She was last seen wearing a red dress, black jacket, and black shoes. And anyone with information is asked to call uh, 210-207-7660. And she went missing on the afternoon of December 20th at a playground at an apartment complex called Villas del Cabo. And it's located in the vicinity of the 9400 block of Fredericksburg Road in San Antonio, Texas. And her age seems to be up for debate. I know, right? That's kind of weird. It is. Or at least I thought it was. But then I ran across this awesome video and I saved it because I want to recommend it to you. I've never seen this person before, but I had put her name into Facebook and I stumbled across this person's uh, Facebook page. And where the heck is it? (laughs) Sorry. And I took a listen and it was very insightful. Very, very interesting stuff. And what it was, was somebody who also came to America from Afghanistan. He called into this person's show. And the channel is spelled I-C-K-E-D-N-E-L. Now, I don't know if they'd be okay with me sharing clips of this. So I'm not going to bother doing that. If you're interested, go take a listen. It was on December 23rd at 9.58 p.m., the video. And he basically gave insight into the culture, you know, and he said a lot of really great things and he was really, really helpful. And at one point he said that, you know, in Afghanistan, you don't get a birth certificate. And he actually talked about a personal story of his where he had to ask his parents, like, when is my birthday? And they were like, we don't know. <laughs> and uh, they they didn't even know what day. Because he's like, could you just give me like a day? Was it like a Monday? Was it a Wednesday? And um, I thought that was a really interesting point, right? Like, I think that's really interesting. Um, it's not something we're used to, right? But it's interesting. And um, when... The news was reporting her as missing. They were saying that she was three, but there's things on the father's Facebook profile that makes it seem like she's possibly four, about to be five, 
in February, but there's other posts that sound like she is three and that she'll be four in February. So there's a lot of arguments over this. I think it's really not that important. You really don't need to know her age to help find her. And let me explain that. So another thing that was seemed to be a very huge debate that people were arguing about was her height and weight. And the reason they were arguing about this was that they pulled out a chart, you know, the chart that we all go by to what our kids should be weighing and how tall they are by age. And they were like, because look, you know, a four-year-old and a six-year-old, there's a big difference and you'd be looking for this and she's really this, etc. And I had a comment because those are guidelines and all kids kind of vary. They're all roughly, you know, small, right? They're not five, six feet tall, but it's all relatively similar to one another. But when you go to the doctor's office and this starts as their little babies, they give you a percentile. My kids were always in the 99th percentile. They were just very big kids. Um, As they grew, they were not in the 99th percentile. Definitely as babies, they were. Um, My my oldest definitely always stood in the 99th percentile. But my middle son, he got tall and skinny, okay? And so there's a percentile. So some kids are in the 10th percent. Some people are in the 40th percent, you know, and it varies, okay? And it's really hard to look at a kid and be like, oh, that kid's probably like 30 pounds. You have no idea without weighing them. And unless you see a little girl out in public and you're going to weigh her, really, you're going to have no idea how much that little girl weighs. So we really shouldn't even be focused on her age, her height, or her weight. We should be focusing on her face, her features, okay? Her eyes, her nose, her ears, her eyebrow, the shape of her head, the shape of her chin, her teeth, her fingers, things like that. Because that's what's going to make you spot her. Because think of it this way. She goes missing now. Let's say she's not found for a year. Well, in that year, that child's going to grow, age, and gain weight or lose weight. So you're not going to recognize them off of those statistics or not statistics, stats. Anyways, right? So you gotta look at her face. What does her face look like? And that's what we need to be focusing on, her face. So I think it was really kind of a silly thing to argue over. I don't really know why people felt like this was so important. I just don't think that it is. I know that when somebody goes missing, they put out their age, their height, and their weight. I get it. But again, you're not out there like guessing somebody's weight or putting them on a scale. You're not going to see a missing adult and be like, I think that person's like 160 pounds and actually be accurate. You could be totally off. They could be like 120 pounds for all you know, right? So, I mean, they put it out, but I don't think that it's super, super important information to even bother arguing over. The next thing I wanted to talk about, and I see this so often in cases, is when police say something along the lines of we're not treating this as an abduction or there's no signs of abduction, people take that as some sort of clue or hint that it must be the parents because they said that it's they're not treating it as an abduction. That's not true, okay? When they say something like um, there's no signs of foul play, there's no signs of abduction, it's not that there was no foul play. It does not mean that there was no abduction, but at that time when they say it, there's no evidence that points to that. That doesn't mean there's evidence pointing elsewhere. It just means that there's no evidence pointing to abduction. So they did come out and say they're not treating it as an abduction case at this point. They are still treating it as a missing person, okay? And so immediately, this made everybody say, hmm, well, that's suspicious. It must not have been an abduction. That's not what they're saying. They just don't have evidence to say that it was an abduction because if they had evidence that it was an abduction, that means they most likely would have some type of evidence pointing to a suspect. And at this time, does not seem to be the case. 
and she has been missing uh, 11, what's today, you know, 15, 16 days. It was the 20th of December. I don't even know what day it is. You know me. I don't, I always say, I don't know what freaking day it is. <laughs> uh, the 4th, okay? So it was initially reported that Lena and her mother were at a playground at the family's apartment complex when she disappeared after her mother left her unattended for a period of time. I know, I know. All of you are like sitting there with eyes bulged. What? She left a three-year-old at the park by herself? I know, I know that's what you're thinking right now. Because when I first saw the story, I was like, oh, what? And that's why it's good not to quickly judge, wait a little bit, investigate more, educate yourself, and then go from there. So when I initially saw it, I saw that there were other children and adults at this playground. And in my head, I thought she probably trusted somebody and said, hey, I'm just going to run to my apartment. Can you watch her for a minute? And unfortunately, they weren't watching and she disappeared, right? This is my initial thinking because I go to playgrounds all the time with my kids. I've been doing it since they were very little. We always went to all these different parks and there are so many times that uh, a parent will say to me, oh, I'm just going to run to the bathroom. Can you watch my kid for a minute? And guys, I'm a true crime person. So I'm like, uh, no, I'm not watching your kid because if something happens, I don't want to be responsible for it. Right? So I'll say to them, how about I come to the bathroom with you? I'll watch your kid outside the stall. Right? So I know that I'm right there. Nothing can happen. The child's contained. I don't have to touch the kid. Nothing. Cause people can accuse you of all sorts of things. But I would never, ever be like, oh yeah, sure, walk way over there and leave your kid I have never seen before in my life with me. No, 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 no. And I'm a helicopter mom, so there's no way in hell I would ever ask um, somebody to do that for my kid. I'm just very overly cautious. Some parents are much more relaxed. I'm not judging anybody. I am just really neurotic when it comes to that type of stuff. So that's what I was thinking because I've actually experienced parents asking me to do that. So I was like, oh, maybe that's what happened. Maybe it was like a neighbor, somebody she was somewhat familiar with. And they said, yeah, sure, I'll watch her. But then they didn't really watch her and she walked off. And yes, the people who were at the park have been um, interviewed by police. So it's not that this mom took the child to the playground and then claimed the child disappeared and there was no witnesses. There were people there. There were a lot of witnesses to them being at this playground. Now, some are arguing, well, there's really no proof that she was ever at that playground. But police have interviewed the uh, people who were at the playground. And I think, based upon experience of following these cases, that if any of them said uh, she was never at the park or all of them said that, the police would definitely know, let the public know that. They would say, well, the mom alleges that they were at this playground, but we haven't found ev any evidence to show that she was at the playground. So I went to Google Earth and we're going to get to this playground thing, but I went to Google Earth because I wanted to see the neighborhood. And I went there and I'm looking around and I don't see a playground. I spot a playground, though, in a uh, another apartment complex that's attached to their apartment complex. And I thought, well, well, I got a ding. I thought, well, maybe, you know, they walked over to that playground, right? Because I've done that. I go to all types of playgrounds. I go to playgrounds in neighborhoods I don't even live in. Um, so I thought maybe it was that. But then I saw that there is a dog park at this apartment complex, which is really odd that they would have a dog park, but not a playground. And appar apparently, oh, I got the hiccups now, beeps and hic oop, hiccups. <laughs> We're all having all kinds of complications here. Um, that the kids would hang out in this dog park and like play on the dog tunnel and all that other stuff. I haven't seen anywhere where it was confirmed that it was the dog park. Just a lot of people talking about it being the dog park. So maybe I missed it or maybe people are assuming that. I don't really know. The news is reporting it as a playground near the apartment complex. 
So that made me think of the actual playground that I saw that looked to be within walking distance. But then the whole going to her apartment and leaving her there makes it even more sketchy because, you know, that's a further distance from their apartment. So I don't know. I'm still trying to figure out if it was the dog park. I'm not quite sure. And if you look at the reviews for this apartment complex, it's not good at all. And there's a lot of complaints about kids wandering around the neighborhood by themselves and causing ruckus and being loud, etc. And I guess that makes sense. If they don't have a playground to go play on, yeah, I could see kids getting into some trouble. But this neighborhood also seems to be a place that uh, other Afghanistan refugees stay, okay? And I go back to this video that I mentioned to you, which was um, I-C-K-E-D-M-E-L. That's the Facebook page that I saw the video. And the guy was talking about in Afghanistan, you know, kids don't go missing um, because, you know, in America, we send these types of people who take or harm children to court. And he said in Afghanistan, they send them to hell. So he was making the point that this is something that they're not used to and that often kids do wander around outside by themselves. And that was really um, enlightening to me. And I thought that was really interesting because I've never been to Afghanistan, right? And um, so I can imagine that You know, if that's something that they were used to or the way that they were raised and if that was something that they normally did with her and this time it just ended badly, um, I can see that if somebody told her like, oh my God, you left her alone, they're going to charge you with endangerment, that there would be a fear to admit, um, you know, that there was impossibly a longer period of time that she was unsupervised than it actually was, right? Because guilt will, you know, set in and you'd be in fear that you're going to be punished for leaving her um, unattended. And, you know, it's not totally odd for a kid to be outside alone playing because when I was younger, I'm not even that old. Well, I am old, but I'm not that old. You know, we did do that. Not at three, not at four, but yeah, at five, six, seven years old. And we knew that as soon as it started to get dark outside, you go inside. Um, Things have changed. If you live out in the middle of, you know, cornfields in Iowa or Idaho or wherever, and there's not a house for, you know, 15 miles, then yeah, it wouldn't be abnormal for kids to just run around. But the majority of people who live in busy suburbs and neighborhoods and apartment complexes and townhomes, etc., no, you you can't safely let your child just run around at three, four, five years old. It's just... You just can't, okay? (laughs) You just can't. That's really young and really, really dangerous. And there are too many horrible people in this world. So, again, I thought it was really insightful for him to say this because I'm like, oh, you know, that actually makes a lot of sense, right? And so he was saying that, like, you know, most people in Afghanistan wouldn't dare do something to a child because they're going to be immediately killed, There's no, like, court. There's no, like, you know, that's it. You're done. Bye. And so most people don't bother. So they're not used to this. And I don't think he was saying that kids don't go missing in Afghanistan. I'm saying, I think he was saying that it's very, very, very uncommon for that to happen. Another thing that he said that I thought was really, really interesting was he was talking about people being judgmental and not knowing about their culture and the father's interview. And the father did do an interview and he had his translator there. And he did get emotional, but I guess some people had been judging him because he wasn't bawling his eyes out and yada, yada, yada. And he made the point that Afghanistan men 
typically don't show emotion. They stay strong. He said Americans are very emotional people. You know, they kind of wear their emotions on their sleeve. And men in Afghanistan, they don't. And then he gave a personal story about how when his mom died, he didn't cry in public in front of anybody. And then, you know, weeks later, he bawled his eyes out alone, right? He stood strong. This is how they um, are raised, the men. Again, I don't think he's saying that all men from there are like that. I think he was giving insight into what the majority are like. And I thought that was really helpful. Because it's so easy for us to see these interviews and say, oh my God, he's not even really crying. I don't even see a tear. But if you're not taking this person's background and culture and experiences and et cetera into context, well, that's why you're so easy to judge and not consider those things. So that was also really helpful. He was a really nice guy. I thought he really, really helped me understand better. So going back to uh, the whole you know, we're not treating this as an abduction thing. The chief also said that there was no potential abduction suspect they're currently searching for. Um, But otherwise, they're using the resources that they would use in an abduction investigation. So it's just because they're not treating it as such because they don't have the evidence showing that it's an abduction doesn't mean that they're not using the resources Um, that they would use if it was an abduction. So I think this is more of a hope thing for the police because he even said the longer time lapses, the less hopeful we become. And I think they're trying to hold on to this missing persons um, view of the case rather than to change it to we think something really bad happened to her and somebody took her. And in addition that they have no direct evidence showing that's what happened. Since her disappearance, they have issued the Amber Alert 13 times. Now, some of you may be confused because usually with an Amber Alert, you have to have a suspect description or the car, but it varies state to state. For example, Summer Wells, there's... No evidence of her being abducted, but they issued an Amber Alert. So they're able to basically decide if that's something they want to do. They decided in this case that they wanted to do it. And um, they have issued it 13 times. So almost every day since she's been missing. It was initially reported that she went missing sometime between 4 p.m. and 5 p.m. on the 20th. Okay. And it was said that the parents reported it to the police at 7. A lot of people have judged them for that because of the two-hour window of time. But you have to remember, you know, when somebody goes into that panic, right, your initial instinct is to look for your child. You're going to be running around freaking out until it becomes real and you're like, I really can't find my kid. I need to call the police. And... It sounds like what happened was that once the mother realized that she was nowhere around, she went looking for her. At some point, she calls the husband. The husband calls a friend, and that friend's the one who calls 911. And I can only assume, and I don't know for sure, of course, but I'm guessing that this friend maybe um, spoke English, and that's why they were the ones who called 911. Now, what sucks is that usually when they do these searches, they stop the searches when it gets dark out. But by 7 o'clock, you know, with daylight savings, it is dark. And so I can't imagine that they searched for her for hours upon hours and through the night, that first night. They had to have called it off at some point. Um, I couldn't really find any information showing me such but I doubt they were out there to three, four o'clock in the morning with, you know, dogs and helicopters and boats and whatever else they needed. Um, you also have to call those resources in, you know, and so the timing of her going missing was probably not helpful. I would need to go back and look, but I think with summer, because she was reported, I think, about 6.30 by the time the police got there, etc., I think they called it off by like 9 o'clock. 
Now, don't quote me on that. I definitely need to go back and refresh my memory on it, but I don't think they were out there all night looking for her. So then they said that from 4.49 p.m. until 8... Wait, it says, from 4.49 p.m. and 5.07 p.m. from the day Lena went missing, there's an 18-minute window where they did not have any visibility of Lena. Now, I don't know if they're coming up with these 18 minutes because this is the times that mom said, but I really doubt that mom said 4.49 rather than saying 4.50. And I doubt mom said 5.07 specifically rather than to say 5.05 or 5.10, okay? So it sounds to me like they actually had some type of footage of her on a camera and at some point there's no more visibility of where she went or or any type of um, footage with her on it. On the 28th of December, about eight days after she went uh, missing, they actually found a bag of bones in an area they were searching for her, but they quickly said that it was unrelated to her, um, which makes sense because there's no way she would have been bones in only eight days. But it's odd, right, that they found bones in the search for her, um, but it's not uncommon. It's happened before, and um, it definitely got the groups excited, to say the least, when it happened, because it's like, oh my god, oh my god. Um, but the fact that they were bones probably should have been a hint that it wasn't her. So then later, um, when the father did his interview, it sounded like he was giving two versions um, of what happened, like conflicting stories through his translator. But I think when you listen to it closely and you can find it, um, it sounds to me like what happened was they were walking or they were going to go to the house to get water, the apartment. Okay. And it sounds like Lena was on the path to their apartment. And at some point she went out of the sight of the mother. The mother goes in to get the water. She comes back out thinking, you know, she went back to the playground. And when she gets to the playground, she starts handing out the drinks. She realizes she's not there. So she goes back to the apartment thinking that she went there and she gets there and she's not there. That's how I took it. Okay. Um, but a lot of people were like, oh, it's conflicting because, you know, if she got out of her sight, then how did she see her on this path? Because it said that she, she was seen on this path. So they're like, well, she didn't see her. How did she see her on this path? I think what it meant was they were on this path together. And at some point, Lena went out of her sight as she went into the apartment. I mean, take what you want from that. There has been a lot of um, agency type people who have been helping in uh, locating her um, there are, you know, the child abduction rapid deployment team, and there's been boat searches, digital billboards, which is amazing. I really don't know why digital billboards are not an immediate thing that's just automatically done with all missing children. And I find it so sad that in some cases, parents have to raise funds to get a billboard of their kid. I hate it. I absolutely hate it. There is a reward from a local uh, organization that... Um, deals with Afghanistan uh, refugees. They initially put up 10,000 and then more people started adding to it. From what I can see, it's about $150,000 at this point. And, um, you know, uh, family has put their lives on pause to come and help and search and people have been donating wipes and diapers and food and money she has a brother the mother is actually currently pregnant i'm not sure how far along she is police have said that the parents are being cooperative but of course there's the language uh, language what was that 
language barrier because the mother, um, you know, and father do not speak English. And um, they said that, of course, their uh, demeanor is that of which you would expect a parent whose child has been missing for a period of time. Both parents were, you know, interviewed by police through a translator for many, many hours when this first began. The father expressed that he believed that possibly his daughter may have gone with another Afghan family, but now believes that she may have been abducted. I'm not really sure why he thought that it could be another Afghan family, but again, there seems to be a lot of Afghan families and Afghanistan refugees in this area and in this community, so maybe that's why. And I don't think that it's odd of him to consider that she was abducted. I mean, she's been missing for over two weeks. I would probably think the same. Actually, I know that because I told a story in my Summer Wells video about my own son being out of my sight for a freaking few seconds, and my mind immediately went to him being taken or dead, okay? Because you go to the worst case scenario. I mean, you go to bed every night for over two weeks without your child. Of course you're going to consider they were abducted. So I don't find that alarming. And I said that in Summer Wells uh, videos because Don Wells said the same and everybody was like, oh my God, why would he say that? It's not abnormal to think that. I, I just don't think that's abnormal at all. He said, quote, during our entire lives, we have not been as saddened as we are as we were yesterday and today. So now the way that this news article words it, it also makes it sound like it could be that the whole reason why the mother went to the apartment was because she lost sight of the little girl. So I think it can go both ways. So this is what this particular article says. It says that the mother was watching her on the playground of uh, their northwest San Antonio complex when the little girl made her way to a nearby path and suddenly disappeared. Her mother thought she may have returned to the apartment unit, unit, but when she didn't find her there, either a search ensued. So that's also possible. So it's either that they, you know, were on this path together to go to the apartment and she got off the path and then the mom went in the apartment and then she came back out thinking she maybe came back and she wasn't there and then she went to the playground and she wasn't there and she went back to the apartment. Or it is that they were at this playground, the little girl went onto the path and she disappeared and the mom's like, well, I'm going to go back to the apartment and see if she's there and she goes there and she's not there. That actually makes more sense how they have this worded in um in this particular article so i'm gonna go with that it sounds less complex and makes a little bit of sense because that would explain why she went back to this apartment better than the other theory he also uh disclosed that they fled from afghanistan in the fall of 2019 due to threats that were posed to us is what he said now, it's Afghanistan. There's no um, denying what has um, been ongoing in Afghanistan. I mean, do I need to even bring up 9-11? Okay. Or what just recently happened in Afghanistan this past summer? Okay. So, yeah, a threat posed to them. So, um, that's not shocking, even slightly. He did not elaborate. That is something to keep in mind involving her disappearance how deep of a threat was it and could that person have traveled to fulfill that threat they have shut down the command post dedicated to searches for her it doesn't lessen the investigation and people think that police are giving up or you know they it's going to become a cold case that's i mean listen you know, taxpayer dollars, right? And there's resources that you need to to do this, the manpower, the resources, the money, etc., right? And so at some point, you have to call off these large, massive command posts, especially since I found that an article that talks about Lena being one of 34 children missing 
currently in the San Antonio area. Okay? That's 34 kids they have to look for. So, yeah, at some point, you kind of have to scale things back. You have to divide out the resources. And if there's no evidence that has been found or any leads, then you have to direct your attention to something else in the investigation, whether that's talking to people at headquarters or uh, asking for camera footage in the area, etc. A biker group, uh, Guardians of the Children San Antonio, has also um, went out to help. And the Eagles Flight Advocacy and Outreach Organization, along with 150 people in the Afghan community, joined forces to look for her. So, yeah, there's a lot of people who have been joining up with the family and law enforcement to help find this little girl. And it's really um, upsetting and discouraging that she has not been found. I am led to believe that she was abducted. And I say this because if she wandered off somewhere um, in this period of time that she has been missing and the amount of land that has been covered and the different resources and organizations and boats and canines and helicopters, etc., I would think how far could she have walked, right? Now, I did a video on Christopher Ramirez. He was actually in Texas too. He was about a month or two ago and he was about her age and he walked away chasing his uh, his dog or a neighbor's dog and he was found uh, three or four days later, five miles from his home alive. It was a freaking miracle that this child, this little boy, um, made it five miles and he was still alive. But that was only within three days. It's been over two weeks. How far could she have really gone? Even if you spread out the search five miles, she's got to be somewhere. And there's a lot of organizations and people that have been desperately looking for her. So I feel like she had to be taken. Now, maybe not, but that's where I'm leaning and yes, they've done underwater searches as well. So, and I I had to check that because my children love water. And we live in an area where we could uh, frequent water, whether it's inlets, beaches, pools, etc. A majority of the year. And we do it as soon as the weather's warm. And we go you know, multiple times a week to different places. And my kids love water. And my oldest son is on the spectrum and he um, loves water. But, you know, he's somewhat unaware of dangers. He knows how, how he's supposed to behave in the pool because I told him a thousand times. I never let them out of my sight. But my worst fear has always been that if he got out, he would head directly for water. That is like the most god awful, sick to my stomach thought that I've had my his entire life because he loves water so much. And most kids on the spectrum do. And when you hear of kids getting out of their home, they're usually found in water. So that's my worst freaking fear. I have a chain on my freaking front door. I mean, alarms on the door. I and mean, it's just one of my worst fears. So they have done that with her because she's three, right? So she may not be special needs, but she's young enough that if she loves the water, she might be attracted to the water and, you know, not be aware enough to not know to, you know, be unaware to not get in the water. Sorry. Um, without her mom or maybe doesn't know how to swim but so far the water that they have searched they have not found her the chief said that there's nothing they haven't done to try to find her they're frustrated and feeling disheartened and disappointed that they haven't come up with anything yet they were asked if there were any suspects that they were investigating and he said that there are some people they are looking at but he wouldn't go further into that, of course. There's been a lot of interviews about the neighbors and other Afghanistan refugees. And 
um, the one news article interviewed somebody who also had fled from Afghanistan. And this person said, quote, it is a very tragic story for us, our community. It's very sad. They cannot tolerate, but we try and we keep trying. And then he went on to say that, you know, he's never seen anything like the search efforts that he's seen for Lena before and said that in his native country, a child doesn't go missing very often. Quote, this kind of stuff, you don't usually see it in Afghanistan since we've seen that men, women, kids, and everybody is scared really badly, unquote. And, uh... So this kind of backs up what the caller that I talked about earlier said, that this is not something they're used to, right? They're not used to constantly seeing search efforts and missing posters or even a child being missing in general. And there's two other things that I want to say here that I've actually said in other videos, but if you're new here, you never heard me say it. So now this is my perfect opportunity. So this person that commented in a group said basically it'd be real nice if the parents got on tv and cried their eyes out and made a plea if they think she was abducted why don't they make a plea for the person to return them and i'm saying it like that because they made like an eye roll um emoji and was implying that they're guilty because why wouldn't they do that (sighs) this bugs me this is something that bugs the living hell out of me It's like people want to see people in their weakest moment so that they can feel better about themselves and how they feel about that person. They want to see those parents on TV bawling and screaming and crying out for their child to make themselves feel better. Isn't that sick? Like, think about that. So that they can feel better about the parents. That's gross. Who would want to see that? This is one of the most devastating moments of their lives if they're innocent. This isn't a game. (laughs) It's not a game, okay? But taking that further, what bothers me is what do you think is going to happen with a plea? You think a parent's going to get on TV and they're going to be like, Oh my God, we love them so much. Please bring my child back. Just drop them all. Blah, blah, blah. And like the person who abducted the child is just like, oh, aw, they really, really love their child. Oh man, what was I thinking? Let me go turn the child in. Come on. When in the history of missing people did a parent go on TV and make a plea for them to return their child and an abductor was like, oh, I all of a sudden have a conscience. Let me go turn the child in. Come on. Again, it goes down to they are only saying that because they want to see their pain so it makes them feel better. Period. That's all it boils down to. The second thing that I've said um, uh, in other videos, and I think it needs to be said again for new people who haven't heard me say it, is that... Oftentimes, people will say, you know, in missing children's cases, whether we want to face it or not, it's always the parents. And in Summer's story, again, I pulled up uh, statistics and uh, we talked about it. And actually, no, it's actually not true. And I know it seems like that's true, but the statistics show otherwise. And the reason why it appears to you like it's always the parents is because you only hear about maybe 2% of missing person cases involving children. So in those 2% of cases that you may hear about or see, it just so happens that the majority of them involves a family member, a parent, a cousin, Um, a boyfriend or girlfriend of the parent, etc. Somebody very close to the child. Actually, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of children under 18 who go missing every single freaking day. And a great majority of them are found safe. Okay? And 
the ones that are not found safe are actually taking, taken by someone they don't know. Again, go look at the statistics. <laughs> but I understand where this comes from because, again, we only see some of the cases. We don't see the thousands of people who go missing every single day. We don't. We don't see it. So it seems like it's always the parents, but it's really not when you look at all the missing person cases as a whole. So I just want to make that very clear. It's one thing to make a statement as an opinion, but does your opinion match facts? That's the thing. So when you make an opinion, wouldn't it be better to have an opinion that's backed up by facts? Yes, of course. So that's why I urge people to educate yourself, look things up, investigate, dig dig deeper before coming to an opinion and making a statement because your statement may not be really credible if the facts don't back it up. So I don't blame anybody who says those sorts of things because yeah, it does seem that way, right? You see a missing person case and you're like, oh goodness, it's probably the parents. Probably the mom's boyfriend, right? Because we're so used to seeing those cases. But there's thousands of others you've never seen before. Trust me, I know. It'd be amazing if every child can get the same attention, but it's not possible because so many go missing. So we don't see them. And like I said at the start of this video, not every case grabs our attention. Okay, and some people talk about certain cases and other groups of people talk about different cases and you may see a little bit of both groups of people, but you're not seeing all of them. You're just not because the news doesn't even cover all of them. There's not enough time in the day to cover all of them. You would need like a 24 hour a day live stream of story after story after story to get these cases out there. And even if that existed, you're not going to sit there for 24 hours listening to all these stories. You're only going to see a few of them. So again, look at the broad picture. Look at what the statistics show. And it leads you to no, it does not mean that every child who goes missing, it ends up mostly being parents or somebody close to them. It just seems that way. And last but not least, now, I said before, I don't think that Summerwell's parents are great people, but I also don't think they have any uh, hand in her disappearance. Not directly anyways. I do believe she was abducted, and I think she was abducted by somebody who was very familiar with the family, their patterns and behaviors, and the property, okay? What I think makes uh, Candace, her mother, seem sketchy is that I think Candace started with the story that it was only two minutes that she was out of her sight when really it was much, much longer than that. But since she started off saying that it was two minutes, then said two to five minutes, then said two to ten minutes, she kind of stuck to that time frame because she does not want to admit that Summer was out of her sight for much, much longer because that would show that she was being neglectful and that she had lied about the time. And I think that's what she's hiding. She just refuses to concede and say, you know what? I lied. It was actually an hour. It was actually 40 minutes. Um, would she be responsible for what happened to Summer? Well, I mean... I think guilt alone would eat her alive. But anyways, this isn't about Summer. The reason why I'm saying this is because I think Lena's mother uh, may have been um, not paying attention to her daughter for longer than she possibly told law enforcement and her husband. Um, because she says she goes on this path and then she suddenly disappeared. It was like four, you know, it's four o'clock in the afternoon. I find that really hard to believe. I think that it was a period of time. Maybe she was on her phone. Maybe she was talking to somebody. Um, I don't think it was a sudden thing. And it, when she says this suddenly disappears, it reminds me of Candace's two minutes. 
I don't think it was ever two minutes. I don't think it was five minutes. I don't even think it was ten minutes. I think we're talking like a good 45 minutes to an hour that Summer was not um, in her sights. I do. And so I think that that's also possible with this mother because you don't want to admit that. You don't want to admit that you weren't paying attention when you should have been paying attention. Right? Like, if you're in this dog area with this fence, my kids... I'd be like, get your butt back in this fence. There's no way in heck that I'm letting them outside that fence without me and out of my sight, period. Does that make me a better mother? Mother, No, I'm a helicopter mom. Sometimes it's a pain in the ass because I can't relax. I wish I could. Believe me, I wish I could be more relaxed. I had a friend, she's super relaxed. Her kids are the same age. She lets them do all sorts of things that I would never allow because my brain won't let me do it. <laughs> I just can't, okay? I'm not saying a better parent, but that alone, like, she's three, possibly four. We don't know her age. You should have been like, get back in the gate where I can see you. So I do think that she was distracted in some way, and it was definitely longer that she disappeared than she's possibly claiming. Does that mean that she's guilty of harming her daughter? No. I think guilty of that and that alone and possibly won't admit that it was longer i don't know because i don't know what she told law enforcement but think of let's see if you're married and your kid goes missing wouldn't you be terrified to admit to your significant other that you weren't paying attention to your child for x amount of time i'd be terrified I'd be like, oh my God, the hell am I going to tell my husband? Like, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, For 15 minutes, I had no idea where our freaking kid was. It's also a protective thing because, you know, uh, you want to, you feel guilt and you're wanting to protect yourself because you don't want to be judged. Okay. And so you kind of make a white lie, so to speak. Now, obviously, being more truthful is helpful for the investigation because we know what kind of time we're dealing with here. But I can understand a woman or even a man, a father, um, being concerned that admitting would, you know, admitting that it was longer can cause great backlash or um, make you feel awful. And at fault. So anyways, little Lena, she is a beautiful, beautiful little girl. Um, Again, study her face. Again, I don't think her age, height, and weight really makes a huge difference. I really don't. It's not worthy of arguing about. And uh, study her face. Share her picture. Share her name. Again, this is in San Antonio, Texas. And... If you want to offer your time in some way, maybe putting up posters for them or, you know, helping in any of the searches, you could um, contact, what was it? Let's see. There were so many agents. I keep getting the hiccups. Eagles Flight Advocacy and Outreach Organization or the Bikers Group. You can possibly contact the Guardians of the Children San Antonio. And the president of that chapter is Justin Text Mir, M-I-R-E. And uh, yeah, so if you can help them in some way, if you live semi-close to that area, the best thing that we can do if we're not in that area is to just share. Share this video, share from my Facebook account, my Instagram account, my Twitter account, or my TikTok. I'm going to post them. I always seem to forget to do that, but I promise I will. And um, you can find my accounts for those at Still Speak Pod. Um, and I am going to, when I get a community tab, I'm going to link you each of those social media accounts so you can find them easier. And let's just help what in the way that we best can help and that's just by getting her face and name out there and let's hope that she is found soon and hopefully alive 
and this turns out to be an absolute miracle. And I'm going to come back tomorrow. I'm not going to make a promise to do Oakley. Uh, uh, uh. Nope, 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 nope. We're going to do Harmony next. Harmony Montgomery and then Oakley Carlson. Then I'm also going to do a condensed version of Summer Wells. And we're going to do Cash Gurdon finally. And uh, uh, somebody else commented about another case. I'm looking into that one. And that's going to be my schedule for my next few videos. Unless something massive happens in any of the cases that we're waiting on. Like Murdaugh, Plank, Trumpy, or Petito. Or uh, Dwayne Selby and Glenda Parton. So we'll just have to see what unfolds now that the uh, holidays are over. And I hope everybody is having a great start to the year. And until next time, I will see you soon.